Right. Welcome, everyone, to the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archive Speaker Series. My name is Stacey Krim, and I am the curator of manuscripts in the Special Collections and University Archives. I have the honor of introducing and speaking to our guest today. Lee Zacharias has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the North Carolina Arts Council. She is a two-time recipient of North Carolina's Sir Walter Raleigh Award and has won Southern Humanities Review, Review's Theodore Christian Hoffner Award, Prairie Schooner's Glenno Luce Award, and two silver medals from the Independent Publisher Book Awards. Lee's book at random was a finalist in literary fiction for the 2013 International Book Awards, the National Indie Lit Awards, and the USA Best Book Awards. Across the Great Lake was named a 2019 Michigan Notable Book, received the 2020 Philip H. McMath Book Award in Fiction, and was a finalist in literary fiction for the 2018 Ford Indie Book Awards of the year. Fiction and nonfiction have appeared in numerous journals, including The Southern Review, Shenandoah, Five Points, Gettysburg Review, Crab Orchard Review, Outdoor Photographer, and Our State. Ten times her essays have been named Notable Essays of the Year by the Best American Essays, which reprinted her essay Buzzards in the Best American Essays of 2008. For a decade, she served as editor of the Greensboro Review. She holds, a degree, holds degrees from Indiana University, Hollins College, and the University of Arkansas, and has taught at Princeton University and the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she is Emerita Professor of English, as well as many conferences, most recently the Wild Acres Writers Workshop the University of North Carolina College of Arts and Sciences, the University of North Carolina Board of Governors, and the Southeast Modern Language Association have all recognized her with awards for teaching excellence. Thank you for speaking with us today, Lee. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to come back to UNCG, even virtually. <laughs> all right. Uh, we would love to have you here in person, but I have to admit Zoom is a lot easier these days. Yes. Um, so to get started, um, you know, we're going to be a little bit self-centered. I absolutely want to know about your early years at UNCG and um, your time uh, with the English program uh, and how it changed over time. So you arrived to teach at UNCG in 1975, right? Yes. Um that was, I think, still the era of bell bottoms uh, and mini skirts. And I still remember going into the Department of English office for the first time because I thought I should let the chair know that he had arrived. And his secretary called into the office, do you have time to see a student? And I, I said, no, no, I'm a faculty member. And I want to say that the look on her face was surprised, but it was probably horrified. Uh, um, I mean, it's, it's a cliche to say it, but the, the department, especially to me, fresh out of grad school, uh, looked like uh, the old Senate. Um, it was just a lot of uh, men and a lot of what to me seemed older men. Uh, some of them were, weren't really much, if any, older than, than I was, but I was just so newly a faculty member and so recently a student, everyone seemed at least a decade older than I was. And there were very, very few women in those days. There were two women who were full professors, uh, another woman who had been hired in the academic side of the department the same year I was and I think another assistant professor, uh, but women's faces were few and far between. And would you say that um, in the English department, most of your students were women at that time, or did you have a good mix? Uh, in in the undergraduate classes, the majority, like ninety, sometimes ninety five percent, were women. Uh, the university had only a decade, a little more than a decade before, 
uh, changed from women's college to a co-ed institution, and particularly in the liberal arts, in English classes, uh, there was still a, a heavy preponderance of women. Graduate classes were a different story. Graduate classes were much more evenly mixed, but the undergraduate English classes that I taught were primarily women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you had also just published your, your one of your first books around that time. So you were a, a new, you had written um, articles and short stories before, I think, but you were a new novelist. Um, and you were, you had taught a little bit uh, before you arrived here at uh, different institutions. So what was it like teaching uh, English in the early years here? Oh, I had a, a great time teaching for, for the most part. I really, really enjoyed my, my students. One thing I do remember about my very first semester, I had taught as a teaching assistant at the University of Arkansas before I came here, which was the first teaching I had ever done. And on the very first day of my uh, teaching career as a teaching assistant, I had been assigned a, a class of uh, freshman English, freshman comp that was meeting in a home ec auditorium. And all of the students were seated at the top of the risers at the very back of the room. And I was on stage and behind me was all the equipment for a home ec class. And I had been instructed to call the role and ask who was not on the role who was there and to try to figure out who was on the role who wasn't there uh, and that that would take three quarters of the first class and I didn't need to worry about anything. I called the role, everybody was there. There was nobody who wasn't on the role who was there. And I had this moment of panic, like what do I do next? And I took a step backwards and there was a gas stove right in front of, right behind me. And I saw it, sent a flame shooting toward the ceiling. So that was my introduction to teaching. And my favorite thing that happened my very first semester uh, at UNCG, I was teaching three undergraduate classes. Two of them were going wonderfully well. One of them was not going well at all. I just didn't seem to be engaging with the, the students. And I couldn't figure out why. The same jokes that I would tell in the other two classes that would go over just would be met with a stone face. And this was in the days when dogs were still running loose on campus. And one day I was teaching this um, class that I later learned was kind of notorious for having unengaged students because it was something that students took to fulfill a requirement for the college, uh, not something that they necessarily took because they were interested in. So a great big dog ran into the classroom. I was perched on the table at the front of the classroom and the dog lifted his leg and peed down the table leg. And one student in the class laughed. <laughs> didn't even smile or try to hide the fact that they noticed. And I just walked out of that classroom and went, you know what? This is not your fault. <laughs> this, this doesn't mean that you are a bad teacher. Um, and it, it got a whole lot better after, after that, uh, when I stopped beating myself up for, for things that uh, were not actually my fault. Uh, plenty of mistakes that I made in teaching were, of course, my fault. But um, having failed to engage that class, or most of that class was not one of them. <laughs> Um, Terry Kennedy says Jim Clark must have loved that story. <laughs> Jim, and Jim Clark probably told that story a completely different way that, that I told it. Um, every story I ever told Jim came out in some remarkable version. And you can ask anyone who went through the program uh, while Jim was there about my getting struck by lightning three times. I have never been struck by lightning, but that was one of Jim's favorite stories. Um, and uh, we have people saying it's it's a good lesson to know as a teacher when something isn't your fault. Um, I, I think that's true. Yeah. 
So you've had, uh, since, since these early years and trying to figure out how to get students engaged over the decades, um, let's talk a bit about what it takes to be a good teacher um, because you've had so much experience in teaching students writing, uh, both in the university environment and in workshops. Um, so just leaving it there, what does it take to be a good teacher? Well, you have to know your subject, but you also have to know that you don't know everything about your subject. There's always somebody who will know something that you don't know, and you need to be open to that. Um, you need to have a passion for your material and to be able to share that passion with the students. But I think it takes more than that. I think you really have to care about the students. You really have to care whether they succeed or not. If it's in a creative writing class, it's about them and their writing. If it's in a literature class, it's caring about whether they succeed in a different way. But you, you really have to be on the student side. You have to maintain a little bit of distance um, because you are after all the, the teacher, but you have to try to see the class from the student's point of view and to figure out in every case, because every student is different, what that student needs. Some, some students, particularly in creative writing uh, classes, feel that they don't get their money's worth unless you just flay them uh, and tear their manuscripts to shred. Others will be just so devastated by something like that, they would never write again. And you have to figure out how to be honest about their work, how to uh, talk to them about ways that they can improve their work that they will be receptive to. Mm -hmm. And um, so in addition to finding out um, how to critique student writing, um, how did you, did you figure out the secret of how to engage students? I, th I think for the most part, teaching upper division courses and teaching graduate courses uh, virtually everyone comes in prepared to be engaged. Teaching uh, freshman classes, which I didn't do very, very much of after uh, my initial ex experience, you have to reach a little bit farther. You, you have to try to uh, relate to the students in some way. Uh, and that becomes harder as the age gap, gap Grows, grows different. I always said that I was going to retire the day someone put a hand up and said, who's Bob Dylan? <laughs> and, and, um, and you get to that point. You, you really do get to that point where the social and cultural frame of reference is so different. And so you have to make an effort to stay attuned to what the students are engaged with. Yeah. And turning a little bit, uh, con combining your teaching style as well as your writing style, how did you teach students how to construct a story from the sentence up or even the word up? How do you construct a story? I think every, every student goes about it a different way and virtually every writer goes about it a, a different way. For me, it is from the sentence up. For many students, it's from the plot down. Uh, and you, you sort of have to figure out where the initial engagement lies and uh, go from, from there. If the initial engagement lies with a plot and anyone who's taught a beginning undergraduate fiction writing class is familiar with that story in which 10 people die on the first two pages uh, you know there are car crashes uh gunfights and all that stuff and you have to um get that student to understand that basically he's starting a car at highway speed uh, and you, you can't turn the first corner if uh, you don't start in, in first gear. And so it's really a matter of, of figuring out where the student started. Uh, and as I say, for me, it's really from, 
from the sentence up. And that's become more and more true uh, the longer that I, I've written. Usually a line or an image will come to me and then that evolves into a novel. I didn't actually have a novel when I came to UNCG. My first book was a book of short stories and it came out, it was supposed to come out, I think at the beginning of the year, but Red Book had bought some material from the uh, publisher. And so they agreed to hold it until I think February. And so the, the book came out in the middle of my first year of, of teaching. Okay, and let's walk through your writing process in depth to a degree. You said you start with an image or a sentence. Can you give us an example of that and then build on that as you would go through uh, creating a story? Oh, I was so hoping you would walk me through it. So then oh. <laughs> in my vast experience as a creative writing author. <laughs> I, can, I can give you an example of um, my, my third novel, Across the Great Lake, uh, really grew out of an essay. I had not been writing fiction for a long time. I had been writing personal essays. And I wanted to write an essay about this town in uh, Northwest Michigan that had meant a great deal to my imagination when I was a girl. And so I did a lot of research for uh, that essay. And that research included uh, learning about the railroad car ferries that used to cross Lake Michigan from this town as, as a port. And when I started reading a history of those railroad car ferries, I just was immediately plunged into this world of these fierce storms, tricky currents, dangerous shoals, and ice, so much ice, because they ran all year round, unlike other boats. And I finished my essay, but I just couldn't let this material go. I was still reading, even though I was done with the essay. And finally, I thought there's got to be a novel in this. And so I wrote a line, we went to the ice, and I had absolutely no idea who we were. I had no idea who was speaking. By the time I finished the first chapter, I realized it was the five-year-old daughter of the captain. Uh, because I knew I couldn't write the story from the point of view of one of the sailors. I just couldn't quite make that leap of imagination. Also, the sailors were all familiar with, with the ship. A lot of routine things were very routine to them, but the five-year-old girl is wide-eyed. Everything is new to her, and she brings that sort of innocent but not entirely innocent child's perspective to what's going on on that ship. So I've figured out who my narrator is. Um, I've figured out because I've written a few sentences that say there's gonna be a storm, there's gonna be a fire, that her mother dies while they're gone, which is the reason her father takes her on the trip. He doesn't know what to do with her because her mother is dying. And I, I was at the Wild Acres uh, writer's retreat and I sat with a friend on the porch there just tossing names back and forth because I realized I didn't even know the main character's name. And we just tossed names back and forth until both of us finally said, that's it, that, that's the one. My last novel began, which I actually wrote before I wrote Across the Great Lake, began with the image of a woman's face in a locker room at a YMCA uh, where she swims probably because I used to swim at a YMCA before the, the pandemic. Uh, and there used to be a TV in the, the locker room or the lounge adjacent to the locker room. And there would be people sitting there and watching it. And I just imagined this woman's face as her husband who's been missing for 11 years makes the news and has, has turned himself in. Uh, Kathy Wilkerson, one of the two weather uh, women who survived the uh, Greenwich Village, the famous Greenwich Village townhouse bombing uh, that killed three of, of their members had recently turned herself in and that was on my mind. What, 
what did the people who were left behind go through? And so in, in both of those cases, I just start with an image or a line. And as I write, I discover. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a planner. I, I don't outline. Uh, and I'm, I am a firm believer that if you can't surprise yourself, you can't surprise the reader. But the surprise has to be indigenous to the book. Um, it's not deus ex machina. It's not, you know, coming out of, out of nowhere. But you don't know yourself uh, as you're writing you reread and you start seeing the clues and then you start emphasizing the clues and they take you someplace that you never imagined you you were going i was in the uh case of across the great lake i was 20 some drafts into that novel before i realized who the ghost was there had been a ghost from the very beginning primarily because there's no such thing as a ship or a lighthouse that doesn't have a ghost um but a ghost needs a purpose. And I just knew that there was one. And 20 some drafts in, it just like a light bulb went off in my head and I realized who the ghost was. And I think it only changed a couple of words toward the end of, of the novel, but it changed my whole vision of, of the novel. So is the storyline in your novels as you're writing, is it a linear progression? Is your creative process a linear progression? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> my, um, my 2013 novel at random, that was one of the rules I had set for myself because the two novels that I had written previous to that, one of them covered 25 years, one of them covered 21 years. There were lots of flashbacks. Uh, and so I just sat myself down and said, this novel is going to cover a very short period of time. I'm very interested, by the way, in how time is handled in uh, fiction and used to teach a course on the structure of fiction that was organized entirely on the principle of how different writers handle time in uh, their novels. So I told myself this has to take place over a very short period of time. There aren't gonna be any flashbacks. And it was really a good discipline. Uh, I think the novel ended up covering maybe two to three months at most, uh, however long it took from having an accident to get to a trial. And, uh, and I wish I'd remembered that lesson <laughs> when I sat down to write my, my next novel. But when I sat down to write Across the Great Lake, I realized that, yes, the story is primarily about what happens to this five-year-old girl but there has to be some retrospect in the story. And so she's actually telling it when she's 85 years old and remembering it because it is the most vivid and most impactful uh, incident of her whole life. It changes the course of her entire life. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're writing about topics uh, that you are not as familiar with, and you now need to have a more in-depth knowledge to make your, your character come to life and make the story move forward. How do you prepare your, yourself for that information? Oh, this is one reason why my study is so messy. This is a, a thing full of notes. Um, when I was writing Across the Great Lake, I had three of these spread out with notes about everything that pertained to the novel. I do an enormous amount of research. And the trick with research, there are a couple tricks with research. You need to know a lot more than you're going to use, and you need to know when to stop using it. Um, and that's hard because you have this temptation uh, to share everything that you found fascinating about this topic uh, with the uh, audience and it just weighs the story down and, and slows the momentum. So I do an enormous amount of research. A lot of it's reading, a lot of it's hands-on, traveling, interviews, uh, talking to people, uh, getting people to share recollections with me. Um, it, um, and the, the other trick about research is that it can be a way of postponing writing. Uh, you, you get so 
to it. Uh, and the thought of starting, uh, of facing that blank page is so, so terrifying that you can oh, I'll just read one more book about this before I start. And you, you have to overcome that. You have to, to start and then you keep researching while you're going on because you keep discovering I need to know this. I didn't know that. At one time, I had a, a studio that was in a building that didn't have internet. Well, at one time, of course, nobody had internet. And so it was a trip to the library, maybe, to, to research something. But I reached a point where I had internet at home, but I did not have internet at uh, the studio where I was working. And I stopped for a while working in that studio because uh, We've all reached a point in our writing, I think, where you write a sentence and you go, oh, I need to Google that. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that. Or I don't even know how to spell that. Just let's, let's look up how to spell uh, this word. Uh, so you're, you're constantly researching. It never ends. I, I even do research after I've, I've published stuff just because I'm so interested in, in the material. Um, that, and that's one of the reasons I'm a very slow writer. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because you started um, at a time when, of course, there was no, there were no computers or internet for you to use. You were probably either writing out stories or typing them on the typewriter. And then you went through the period of transitioning through word processors to uh, computers. Did that technology shift affect your writing? I... I did not write by hand when I started writing seriously. I wrote by hand when I was a girl. Oh, uh, I think we've talked about this before. I, um, I was hooked on girl detective fiction when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And so I was writing these imitation, Nancy Drew, Dana Girls, Judy Bolton uh, things. And, and the problem with them inevitably was that I couldn't figure out how to solve the mystery that I constructed for myself uh, and they'd get abandoned. But I, I wrote in these steno books that we used to use for class notes back in the dark ages when I was a girl. And uh, my, my mother had forbidden me ever to write. Uh, and she specifically forbade me ever to write about her once she found out that I was a writer and that was actually my career. But she found one of these novels that I'd hidden under my mattress. And she was so angry about it that I did not set word to paper again until I was safely away at college. And when I was at college, I had a typewriter for research uh, papers. And I would just sit on my bed with a typewriter between my knees and uh, type stories that way. So moving to a keyboard was a natural process. I think what, what changed is the process of revision because you don't have to type your whole novel over every time uh, you make a revision. And that, that was something you had to do back when uh, you were using a typewriter. And when, when I was in grad school at Arkansas, I was living in a furnished house. And what I was using for a desk was one of those uh, old fashioned women's dressing tables that have the drawers rising on each side. And then a little shelf in the middle with a mirror and you put on your makeup and your jewelry there. Uh, well, I took the mirror off because I don't want to look at myself while I'm I'm writing, but I was using a typewriter. And of course, with a typewriter, every time you hit the carriage return, the typewriter migrates a, a little bit. And so about every two or three pages, I would have to physically pick up the typewriter and move it back because it was running into those raised drawers on, on the side. So I don't have to do that any anymore. Um, and I, um, I, probably revised more since the advent of word processing because it's easier to change small things. Um, so, and I'm, I'm a person who works on individual chapters as separate documents because I find it easier to negotiate and find things if uh, I'm not dealing with 
300 or 500 pages uh, because I can never remember exactly how I worded something. And so you type a phrase into advanced find and it won't find it because that's not exactly the way you worded it. So it's easier to deal with the documents that are 20 pages long or you know, 15, 30, 30 pages long. And so I'm, I'm really tinkering an awful lot with language since the advent of word processing in a way that I probably didn't in the days of the typewriter because you would have to type everything all over again because you struck out a sentence or you added something here. Uh, so I tinker at the level of the line a lot more with word processing. And then finally, uh, some, of, some of those chapters may have been through 40 drafts or more. When I get the whole thing done and I think it's ready, I paste it into a single document and I call that my first draft. Uh, but much of the material has been through many, many drafts even before it becomes a first draft. And of course, that didn't happen in the days of the typewriter either. You know, that's a very interesting point. I, I think that would be interesting for writing students to know about that when you're you're not writing one book, you're writing 40 books <laughs> to that eventually turn into one book. Um, can you speak a little bit about that, that effort? But, well, I do write linearly, um, even though I don't treat time in a linear way. I, I do write from front to back. I, um, I, I know people who say I write the good parts first and then I go and, and fill in, or I, I write the last chapter first and then I figure out how I'm go going to get there. I, I do write in order. I work on chapter one before I work on chapter two, before I work on chapter three, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so in my mind, it's it may be 40 separate documents, but it's not 40 separate manuscripts. Um, it's just the they're separate documents because it's easier to find my way around them uh, on the computer. But I have a strong sense of how one connects to the other and follows another that follows another that follows another. And I should mention uh, Special Collections and University Archives here at UNCG is the repositories for uh, Lee's uh, manuscript collection. So you can see uh, many of these various drafts and her entire creative process uh, in our archive. Um, I, I always find with students there when we pull out collections, especially collections that have correspondence with other editors or with the publishers of the books, um, they, the students have a difficult time accepting the degree of revision that may be suggested by editors and publishers to the author. Uh, can you speak a bit about your experience in dealing with, with these types of suggestions? Yes, you have to figure out where you make a stand. You have to, you have to listen with a completely open mind um, because if you're, and this is, this is true for students who are in writing workshops, when their manuscripts are being discussed, they need to listen with an open mind. That, um, some students have a tendency to want to say, but no, I did this because, and to defend and explain their, their work. And what that means is that they're not listening and that their mind isn't open. Not everything that everybody says to you in a workshop is going to be useful. Not everything that an editor says to you, not everything that an agent says to you is going to be useful, but you have to listen with an open mind. Then you have to think about it and you have to use what makes sense to you. Sometimes that means parting with an agent or parting with an editor or, or not having a book published by a publisher that you really wanted, but you have to be true to the integrity of the work finally. And you just, you, you have to have a large sense of, of what that is, a sense that's open to things that you hadn't considered. But uh, in my novel, Across the Great Lake, uh, which 
I, I would describe as a memoir, except it's fiction. It's written in the form of a memoir. It's written in the form of you find something out at the end that changes your sense of everything that came before, as opposed to a what happens next, what happens on the next page uh, sort of novel. And there were uh, agents and editors who wanted me very much to make it that kind of what happens next novel and to change it to the third person. And that that was a bottom line for me. The, the narrator's voice was so important to me in that novel. I just realized that that's a suggestion that I can't take, even if it means that the book never sees print. I cannot put this book in the third person. It doesn't belong in the third person. Uh, I think there were a few um, people um, editors, agents who wanted one of the sailors to molest the girl. And I so was not going there. I wanted whatever happened on that ship to be something that the girl caused, that the girl did, and not something that was done to her. And to me, that has to do with the basic integrity of the book, a kind of your protagonist is responsible for his or her actions, and those actions have consequences. And I wanted very much for that protagonist, even though she's a five-year-old girl who would be excused by anybody and everybody for what she did, they would say, but you were only five years old and, and diss it, but she can't diss it herself because she knows what she did. And so there were a lot of suggestions that I ended up not taking with that book, although there were many that I did, and it's a stronger book for that. Uh, and I think you have to realize that uh, these people do know something. Uh, some of what they know is market driven uh, and you have to decide what your priorities are. Is, is your priority to get your book out there in front of as many readers as possible, no matter the cost to the book, or is your priority to the book? Uh, and you have to be open to, to suggestions, but you don't have to take them all. Okay. And you really have a very strong idea of, um, or you can really very strongly relate to this little girl in um, Across the Great Lake. Can you talk about a character, especially a main character, who you had, uh, you knew this person had to be a main character, but you had a really difficult time relating to them. Um, but they were centered in the story, so you might have, you probably had to keep them. Did you ever have a time like that? A couple of times. Uh, the the two protagonists of my novel at random, which came out in uh, 2013, are a couple. Uh, and so the male point of view is uh, very important in that point of view. And I really had to make a leap of imagination to, to write his point of view. And they're at odds. They are at their least attractive moment in, in that book. Something terrible happens to them that's an accident on the very first page of the book. And they react in different ways to it. And the different ways that they react um, drives them, them apart and causes them, each of them, to behave badly uh, in, in some ways. And so I had to, to make a leap to, to say, okay, this is how Eva would react. This is how Guy reacts. And he's really giving in to the petty side of himself that I don't like, but I had to become him. I had to become her. Uh, in uh, the, the basic incident at the beginning of my most recent novel, What a Wonderful World This Could Be, is something that is so politically incorrect and something that I, I really can't imagine happening in uh, today's world because people would be much more conscious about it. But I had to project myself into a character who was in almost every 
way very different from from I was. She grew up uh, with uh, privilege in terms of class, money, education, uh, things that I, I didn't have. She also grew up with no supervision whatsoever. Um, we can tell how supervised I was if my mother forbade me ever to write and was pilfering under my mattress to, to see if I disobeyed her. So I had to um, really make a leap again into that, that character. But once you do that, you become that character. That character isn't you, but you have to become that character because you have to know that character from the inside out in order to write the character. And uh, what, uh, what are you presently working on? I, I will say what a wonderful world this could be is your latest book, right? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll answer your next question in a second. One, one thing I'll mention about uh, what a wonderful world, no, uh, across the Great Lake in terms of your last question was that I had a moment of panic when I realized I'd put this five-year-old girl on a, a boat with uh, 28 sailors and I'd never been around sailors in my whole life and I had no idea how they talk and I mentioned this to a student of mine who is from Wisconsin she said oh just have them tell Ole and Lena jokes well I'd never heard an Ole and Lena joke on my life in my life so I had to look one up online and as soon as I put one into the mouth of one of those sailors it was like I'd been sitting around the mess listening to them talk my entire life every single one of their voices came to me and they're not my main characters but I still had to be able to inhabit them and that was a real leap uh, right now I am working on a memoir that is primarily centered on my mother's life and my relationship to her. Her, um, her life was very different from mine, not only uh, because of uh, vastly different times that we, we lived in, but her mother died when she was a young girl. She had no memory of her mother at all. And it impacted her life uh, to the point that she was extremely clingy and possessive and, and domineering. And I've, uh, I've had to, you know, sort of examine her life. I've done a lot of genealogical research and uh, I'm trying to understand my <clears throat> parents' very, very difficult marriage with a sympathetic point of view to both of them. Uh, after my mother died, I found my father's letters to her from 1941. They, they met in April and they got married in uh, February of 1942. My father was a merchant marine. Pearl Harbor happened during their courtship. And so their courtship was primarily epistolary because he, he was off on a, on a boat. And these letters were, were from a person I never met. Um, they, they're from my father, but this is not the father I knew. And that's what really propelled me to write this, this book. It's been very slow going because it, it's been hard emotionally uh, as well as difficult with, in terms of the writing uh, and in terms of the, the plotting. Uh, memoir and, and fiction are so different. Short uh, memoirs, personal essays to me, have much more in common with poetry than they do with fiction. But to sustain a book length work of nonfiction, you have to have a kind of narrative arc. And that's been a struggle in, in this book. But I've, I've finished a third draft and am about to start working on the edits on the third draft. And you mentioned your your mother did not want you writing anything about her. So you have that shadow. Oh, you, you betcha. And uh, <laughs> this is a real story. People will think I'm crazy, but uh, my, my mother was so adamant that I not write about her. And yet, uh, because she lived to be 98 and was not 
in good health in the last many years, I was sort of a captive audience in her den. And all she talked about, my mother was a narcissist. All she talked about was herself uh, and her story. But that was material I was not ever supposed to use. I don't know what else I was supposed to use. But uh, I was uh, working on the very first chapter, which has to do with her falling. She died at the age of 98 from complications of a fall. She really belonged in assisted living for the past the last 10 years of her life and was too stubborn to go. I found her four days after she had fallen and she was still alive and she died mad at me because I called the ambulance. Um, but I was working on this chapter. She had been falling for 15 years before this fatal fall. Uh, and I was the only one who knew because she could keep everyone else who visited for 15 minutes from knowing. But when I visited, because I live a thousand miles away, um, I was in residence 24 seven. And so I'd, I'd go off to get a drink of water and I'd hear a crash. I'd go to the bathroom and come back and find her wedged between her recliner and the hassock. Uh, so this, this chapter has to do with the 15 years of her falling before her death. And I was working on edits. I was on the porch at uh, Wild Acres this summer and I was working on edits on that a printout of that chapter, and I stood up from a rocking chair, twisted my ankle, and fell. Uh, don't tell me that's a coincidence, because <laughs> I won't believe it. You can tell me I'm crazy, but you can't tell me it's a coincidence. Are, are you going to include that in your, your story, and your memoir? Probably not, um, because it's um, the, the last chapter of it is photoshopping my mother because it contains scans of my father's letters and a lot of pictures that are part of the text, not in the glossy little insert sections. And uh, so I've had to scan just hundreds of old pictures to find what I wanted to use. And anyone who's ever scanned old pictures knows that they can look fine as you just hold them in your hand. But once you blow them up on a computer, they are so full of scratches and dust spots and little pinholes that the scanner probably puts in. So you have to Photoshop them to a, a great extent. Uh, and uh, at, at times when you're dealing with the sky, for instance, you, you're using the um, magic, uh, what do they call it, the, um, the healing brush. Uh, and you're taking the healing brush and instead of going dot, 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 dot uh, in the sky, you just, you drawing these little loops from dot to dot because it's quicker and it's easier. And until you lift your hand and uh, take the cursor away, you've got these loopy black lines and it, they look like constellations. And so the, the last chapter has to do with drawing new constellations for her life. And I have a picture of the two of us. I think I'm three years old and it's a great picture of the two of us. I'm wearing a little sailor cap and my mother's sitting there. I think we're at Starved Rock in Illinois, but her eyes are closed in the picture. And when I tried to use the new feature in uh, Photoshop elements to open her eyes, it said, we detect no human faces in, in this picture, probably because it's so old and not, not that sharp. But um, so the, the notion is that I'm drawing these new constellations and everything will be perfect. All she has to do is open her eyes, but she can't. Wow. So won't do it. Um. And you're, so you, you're working in Photoshop with repair of these photos and you are a photographer as well. Um, so uh, photo, photography has a specific meaning to you. And you're obviously very visual when it comes to creating stories because you're getting these images in your head as, at the start of the stories. Yeah. Um, did, was photography a natural outgrowth, do you feel, of your style of writing? I've, um, I've been torn my whole life between the verbal and the visual. I would say that I'm a better writer than I am photographer. I'm, I'm a pretty good photographer. I'm, I'm certainly not great. 
Uh, but I, um, I developed a love for stories as a tot. My mother read to me every night. Uh, we didn't have good literature in our house. What she read to me were little golden books. To the end of her life of Alice in Wonderland, which we had the little golden book version of, she said, I never cared for that story. She liked stories like Busy Timmy and the Pokey Little Puppy that had their le lessons in promptitude and tidiness, you know, as opposed to something surreal like Alice in Wonderland. But I I don't think she ever knew that the little golden book wasn't the original Alice in Wonderland, wasn't Lewis Carroll's words. Uh, so I, I learned to love stories sitting on my mother's lap. My mother had photograph albums. She had a brownie camera. She was not really a photographer, but she had a photograph album that went back to the 1920s when she was a girl. And I loved to look through these uh, photograph albums. We, um, we were actually displaced from Chicago. I was born on the south side of Chicago uh, in Woodlawn. And in 1950, the second wave of the Great Migration sent us across the state line to what is now the Rust Belt of Northern Indiana. At that time, it was the, the Steel Belt. And these pictures were of her youth in Chicago. And she so mythologized Chicago, which was completely cut off from me from the time I was five years old, that I would look through these albums and these, these pictures just had a mythic power for me because it was it was like I was an exile and this was the country I could not go back to ever. And so I I really ended up writing because I um I was doing both. I, uh, I had finished my undergraduate degree. My first husband was a PhD student and then an instructor at VCU in Richmond. And I was dabbling around with uh, undergraduate fiction writing class and uh, photography classes. And I had reached the top level in the photography classes, which was printing color. And in those days, you did it the old fashioned way in a dark room with the sandwiches of magenta, cyan, and uh, yellow filters. Uh, and uh, so, you had to experiment a lot to get the right proportion of filters. And I ran out of paper one day. And at that time, printing color was much more expensive than printing back black and white. And I went to the camera store to buy a new box of paper. Uh, this would have been in the early 1970s. And it was like $45. And I just looked at the price on this box of paper and thought, not only are you not making any money at photography, you're not even trying to make money at photography. All you need to write is a pencil and a legal pad. Uh, so I put the paper back on the shelf, went home and sent off an application to Hollins College to go to graduate school in writing. And that's how I ended up being a writer instead of a photographer. Wow. Well, we're, we're uh, getting towards the end of the time. So I wanted to open up the chat to questions. So anyone in the audience, if you have a question, please put it in chat. And while people are thinking of their questions, is there anything you wanted to add, um, like the magic wand that will make creative writing easy? You know, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the wand with me because <laughs> I've, um, I was at Wild Acres this summer and they have a theme party every year. And the theme party this year was magic on the mountain. And so I have a magic wand, but I ended up getting sick and going home and not going to the party. And I just found the wand in the back of my car yesterday because I keep a, a bin of costumes over there because I have to dress up for a lot of things at, at Wild Acres. So it's too bad I don't have the magic wand here. I, I, I think the magic is persistence. Um, you know, it's just put your butt in a chair and do it. Uh, just some people need to do it every day. Uh, not everyone needs that discipline, um, but you do have to do it. And you get better as a result of practice. Right. 
So our first question is, do you retain multiple drafts digitally or do you alter the document then save over the file? I do keep multiple digital copies. I wouldn't say that I have every single one because I'm, I, I'm just amazed what I hear writers talk about having done five drafts of a book, like that's a big deal. I mean, I've already said that I may have 40 drafts of a single chapter before it ever gets pasted into the document I call my, my first draft. So if I saved every single one, I would have so many files on my computer, I wouldn't be able to find my way through them. But I do save all the major ones uh, digitally, and I will label them so that I can find them first draft, second draft, third draft. Uh, and then when you go to hit send, you, you need to make sure you're sending the right one. And so I always have one that's marked final. Uh, and I make sure that that's the one that gets sent when I hit that button. Um, but yes, I, I try to preserve as much as I can. And I do preserve um, maybe much to the library's horror because they, they had to use a big truck to come get my stuff. And I hate to tell them I have more because <laughs> I'm writing since then. But I, I do save the printouts that I scribble all over because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bad for trees and I love trees, but I'm, uh, I, print a lot. I think that may have to do with age to a certain extent, you know, because I was used to the typewrite written copy. So I print a lot, I scribble all over it. Then at a certain point, I realize I'm making so many changes, I need to get back on the, on the computer. Um, so I, I save both the printouts with my handwriting on them and save the digital copies of the major drafts. Right. And, and we love as many drafts as possible. We like to see every single change. That's what we want preserved. So you're, we'll, we'll come with our big truck and get it all again. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, the, the next question is, do you ever set daily writing goals such as a certain number of words or a certain number of pages? No, because I would fail. Um, I, I did at one time when my son was little, um, he was going to a summer day camp. And when I was teaching, summer was my main time to write. And I actually had an office in the tower, the library tower. And so it was a UNCG sponsored day camp. I would take him to campus, drop him off at the bus that was taking him out to Piney Lake at eight o'clock in the morning, go to my office, and stay there until five o'clock when it was time to pick him up. Uh, and I got an incredible amount of work done that way. But uh, I, my life is so interrupted by so many things. My house is a hundred years old. It's falling down around my ears. Uh, and uh, there constantly seem to be, you know, life crises that need dealing with, you know, and so you're you're like the kid with his finger in the dike uh, instead of the kid with his fingers on the keyboard a lot of the time. Um, but I I I definitely write when I can. Okay. And if anyone else would like to put a question or a comment really quickly in chat while we're wrapping up, I do want to mention that. Our next uh, Special Collections and University Archives anniversary presentation will be on September 6th uh, and uh, at noon, and that will feature Leonard Moore, author and poet. Anyone else have a question and or comment for Lee? Because I think you've given so much information about writing and teaching in this presentation. Uh, your your pres this presentation, your this talk should be like a textbook for English class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. I have learned so much. So people saying it was fascinating, it was amazing, and thank you. Well, and uh, people, I think found, found this a great talk according to chat. So thank you so much for speaking well, with us today. It is always a pleasure. I love hearing you talk about your creative process and you talk about your own stories. Thank you so much for having me, um, for your questions. Uh, it really was my pleasure. 
Well, thank you. And I hope we'll, we'll be able to speak again, maybe with the second half of your collection. And I'll, I'll go through it and have more questions for you. <laughs> Great. If, if I ever finish the, this memoir and get it out, then we can talk again. All okay. right. That's the goal. That's, that's my writing goal for the person who asked the question. It's not a daily goal. I'm, I'm set more like long-term goals. All right. Well, good luck with your memoir. And uh, thank you, everyone who stayed with us today. And please yes, tune, thank in, you. tune in uh, in September to see our next presentation. And thank you, Lee. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, everyone.